back at the Collision Conference in Toronto, one of the world's largest technology conferences. And speaking with us today right now is Sridhar Ramaswamy. He's the co-founder and current CEO of Neva, a privacy-focused search engine. We'll be talking about what that means exactly. Previously, he was uh, uh, working at Google as a software engineer and also worked at a venture capital firm. So he's got both sides of the aisle, the engineering and the finance side. I want to talk to you about so many things, search engines, privacy, NFTs, the current crypto space, yep. and where DeFi is headed. But first, let's uh, introduce yourself to the audience. What kind of work were you doing at Google and what kind of work do you do now? Yeah, I joined Google early as a software engineer, but I was lucky that I was in this hyper growth phase of Google. I started running the search ads team. When were you at Google? I started in 2003. Okay. Um, I was there for 15 and a half years. Yes. Um, and so I got to run the search ads team and then all of the ads business team. I did that for four or five years. Uh, so it was crazy. I was running a team of one myself to running a team of over 10,000 people at Google and a $100 billion business. That's when I decided to press the reset button and start over and start Neva, which in many ways is the opposite of what I did at Google. Yeah. So it made for an interesting change. I want to talk about Neva and yeah. the changes you've made to this search engine versus yep. your experience at Google. But first, I want to learn a little bit about Google because a lot of people might have these questions. Uh, first of all, Google was not the first search engine. It wasn't the only search engine. Right. How did it become the dominant search engine? Well, Google became a really good search engine because it uh, took an algorithmic approach to solving search. Uh, the key insight that Larry Page, which is now called PageRank, that he had was a page is good and popular if other popular pages point to it. Now, it's a little bit of a contradictory definition. You're popular, it's kind of like high school. You're popular if all the popular kids think you're popular. So, but that was the basis of creating a much better product. And Google was also incredibly shrewd. They worked with a number of people like Yahoo, like AOL, to power search for these companies. It's a combination of a great product plus really good, sharp, business-minded people that created the massive success Google has become. Can you briefly, in layman terms, describe how this algorithmic process works? When you type in a keyword, how does a search engine produce billions of results? Yeah. Uh, and rank them. And in, very quickly. This is part of Google's magic. It essentially figured out a way to take really cheap, inexpensive computers, tie them together in these data centers, and then create this amazing product called Search. So when you type a query in, it literally goes to thousands of computers, all of which do a little bit of work, send back results to a central place, which sorts it, uses the secret sauce of things like PageRank, the popularity signal, to figure out what the best pages are. And best of all, all of this happens in a fraction of a second. Um, and there's not many search engines. There are not many people that have built this technology from scratch. There's Google, there's Bing, and now Neva is one of the first companies to rebuild this, certainly in this decade, of doing search from scratch. So you talk, let's talk about Neva now. You yeah. co-founded the company in 2019, right. so quite recently. Yeah. And are you still in the startup phase, would you say? We are about 70 people. Okay. We are at a place where we are like, okay, we have built out a base product. We think our product is really very good. As I was saying earlier, outside of Google and Bing, we are the only people that's investing in the foundations of search and actually crawling the web, creating an index, and giving you the best pages that there are. How does Neva Diva differ from Google? Uh, first of all. In your philosophy, in your approach, in the that's technology. Right, that's right, that's right. Our fundamental philosophy is that a search engine should be about serving you, the user, and the customer. So we took a business model of we want to be paid by customers. This meant that we didn't need to show ads, we didn't need to track people, we didn't do all these hideous things. Now search is very personal. You don't have ads. We don't have ads. We're completely customer paid. This lets us focus on creating a superior search experience. It's highly personalized. When you search for something, you can decide what kind of results you want to see. You can influence a search algorithm, and the search engine's only focus is giving you great results. It's such a liberating feeling. People should try us out, neva.com. And we also made the base product free. There's a freemium product, and there is a paid subscription which is five bucks a month or 50 bucks a year. That's the only way in which we are going to make money. Okay, uh, let's, let's talk about the business model first and we'll talk yeah. about the technology. So you don't have any ads, you, you have, have a subscription ads. model. Yeah, subscription how do you, how, so what's your revenue streams? It's customer subscriptions. Okay. 
people pay for the product that they use. The obvious question is, why would I use a subscription model when yes. there's free search engines? Because we, we, this lets us create a much better product for you. Okay. Um, Google currently is maxed out on users. There are no more users for Google to get. The only way they make more money is by showing you more ads, is by obscuring the ads that they show you. Okay. Um, the load keeps going up and up. There are tons of articles written everywhere about how Google is impossible to use. We are like a breath of fresh air. You use us, there's only results, 100% from top to bottom. This lets us create very personalized experiences. So for example, you can connect your Dropbox to Neva and be able to search over all the documents that you have at work or at home from the same search box. You can customize what kind of news you like. Maybe you want more news from Kitco. You can, you can boost those up. And so we create a very personalized, very differentiated experience all because of the business model. Yeah. And only a small fraction of users have to sign on to the subscription offering for us to be a very profitable company. Search is cheap to run. How many users do you currently have? Can you disclose that? Uh, we are at about half a million users early, but growing like a hockey stick. Uh, I want to read your digital bill of rights That's from right. Neva. Right. Very interesting, not a lot of companies have this. So just like our country's bill of rights, it, yeah. it says, uh, this bill of rights guarantees a core set of privileges for every American. We have believe we at Neva believe that you should have basic rights when you use the internet. So I'm just going to read the first part yep. on privacy. This is interesting. It says, we have been, we have become resigned to the fact that tech companies track our every move. You wouldn't agree to someone watching you in your living room. So why is your internet activity any different? Your home, the possessions you own, and the digital information you create are your private property. Businesses need to respect your privacy online and offline. Okay. Um, Let's talk about that first. So is it true that I own the information that I generate? You should own the information that you generate. Unfortunately, the way privacy policies are specified, you give away all your rights. You let it be exploited wherever you go. Why isn't Facebook and Google paying me? Because they have no incentive to. They have no incentive to make a better product or to pay you. They make all of the money that they can off of you and this information slashes around. A, a product like Neva, with its focus on you, actually saves money for you because you're not going to be bombarded with ads everywhere that you go. You're not going to be tracked. Um, deeply personal searches, maybe you have a headache, that's not going to be exploited and monetized. Yes. And we can do all of that because we focus on you. But you said Neva customizes my search results, so it must, it must store my user and have machine learning to anticipate what I want, right? Doesn't that store my own personal information? At all times, you're in charge. First of all, you can turn this off if you like. You can say, I don't want any personalization. Right. I just want a great search engine. Okay. Plus, the guarantee with Neva is your data is never given to anyone else. It's never shared, never used for profit. It is used to make your search experience better. That's the beauty of the subscription model. It's all about making your experience better. Okay. And you're fully in control. Right. Zuckerberg's court case a few years ago, famous uh, testimony to Congress when they asked him about privacy online yep. and the senators grilled him about where this data goes when the user of Facebook, for example, has all this information and the, the controversy was that Facebook was selling this data to third-party vendors, to advertisers. There's analytical scandal. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, he denied some of these claims, but tell us about this trend in the tech industry. Is this happening all over, not just Facebook? Tech companies are motivated by one thing, to increase profit. That's what companies in general do. And they see user data as an unlimited resource to mine. There's no limit to what they will do in order to mine the data. People are very surprised that the phone number that you put into Google or Facebook as a two-factor authentication, as a way to get back into your account if you're locked out, yeah. that is used for ads tracking. Right. So it's things like that that just keep going up and up and up. And so really, we need to have more competition so that we can make informed choices as consumers and customers. Well, this is a question for investors. Uh, yeah. Tell me if this is true. This is something that one of my uh, investor friends have told me about Tesla, for example. He says the valuation basis for Tesla is not its cars, it's not its energy yep. division, it's in its data. The thousands and tens of thousands of miles you drive in your Tesla collects, the car collects driver information, habits, that information, that data is priceless yep. for the company. Right. Is that true? That is likely true. But it doesn't mean that you don't have choice. 
I've turned off a bunch of data collection on my Tesla. And they can't do anything about it because I bought the car. I decide what I want to use. Similarly, we think with a company like, you know, a company like Neva should exist. We have a freemium model. It's free for you to try it. We are confident that our product is good enough that a fraction of users are going to pay. And they are paying. So to me, it's all about offering options. Right now, with the big tech players, you don't have options. You think like, I can't do anything about search. I can't do anything about privacy. We are that important option. There's a concern amongst not just congressmen, but also users of the internet that Google and other search engines, perhaps even Neva, I'd like to comment on this, these search engines are censoring certain pieces of information that it deems to be misinformation. The controversy here is that Google has been indirectly motivating or incentivizing people to think a certain way, to have a certain political alignment almost, because it censors certain views that it deems to be misinformation. YouTube does the same. You've worked at YouTube before. Can you comment on this? So what happens in practice is that social media algorithms, algorithms that have recommendations built into them, they have a natural tendency to amplify the crazy, to amplify like the really sensational. And that can become a vector for spreading more and more misinformation. It's a little bit simpler when it comes to search. And uh, while Google doesn't do this, we offer you the option to decide things like your favorite search providers. So when you look for news, we will give it to you the way you want it, not according to somebody's idea of what fair news is. Okay. So Google pretends to be fair, but there's no such thing as being fair to eight billion people. Your viewpoint is necessarily different from my viewpoint. Our approach at Neva to searching is you're in charge. You decide what you want to see. Okay, well let's just take COVID for example. Yep. Lots of examples there. If I publish an article and say something like, I don't know, the vaccine in your body is gonna track you with little devices and now the government knows where you are because the vaccines have little trackers. Yep. We know that's not true. How does the algorithm know that's misinformation? Well, first of all, uh, we look at where you publish this article whether there are other reputable sites that point to this and say that, you know, yes, this is worthwhile. We also rely heavily on community forums like Reddit, which are actually quite militant about what content exists on them. We look at all of these quality signals to decide if a particular page is the right answer for a query. But if you search for David Covert article and you wrote it, it's a search engine's job to surface that result to you. Right. It's a different story when YouTube recommends misinformation videos. That's a whole other problem. But a search engine's job is all about finding the information that is out there and giving it to the users. Uh, more conservative people have been saying that, well, search engines, uh, social media, have been censoring more conservative viewpoints. Uh, for example, the notion that the election, well, I'm not trying to be political here, but just the notion that the election was stolen and that Trump actually won the election and that the left stole the election. A lot of articles about that subject were removed or censored or taken down. Um, is, there, is there any truth to the notion that it was programmed in such a way to remove conservative viewpoints, quote unquote? So I think there is a spectrum in conservative. Okay. I think when it comes to this election misinformation, I think like, I mean, this election fraud, there is more and more evidence, even from people like Attorney General, General Barr, that he did not believe that there was manipulation of the election. Okay. This is a, like, died in the world Republican. But I think the general viewpoint that certain voices are not heard is very real. And it basically goes back to my earlier point that Google pretends that there is one truth for every single thing. Yeah. We put you in charge. Um, and we think that, you know, you should, be, you should be deciding what are the news providers you prefer to see. I just want to talk about ads for two minutes, yeah, okay? Please. Switching gears here. Elon Musk got a tweet. YouTube seems to be nonstop scam ads. Yeah. Um, you've worked at YouTube before. Can you, can you just comment on this and, and assess whether or not his evaluation is accurate? First of all, I actually pay for YouTube Premium. <laughs> so I am happy to pay I like many this things is, on YouTube. I refuse to pay for YouTube Premium because for me, it sounds like the company, this is not, it sounds like the company is blackmailing me. It's like, if you don't pay for us, we're gonna give you a bad experience. So you have two choices. So I refuse out of principle, not because I can't afford it. But you yeah. have two choices. Right. You can, use, you can use YouTube on desktop and install an ad blocker. Yeah. <laughs> or you can use it on your phone and pay yeah. for YouTube Premium. That's right, yeah. I use an ad blocker. 
and I pay for YouTube Premium. So my belief is that quality con you know, information, like the information you're producing, there should be a monetization. We should support good content that is out there. Yeah. I find a lot of ads on YouTube to be super sketch, super scammy. I told you, we have YouTube Premium. My wife bought a new phone, opens up YouTube. There is an ad there that says, your phone is full. She's like, what the hell, I just bought this phone. Turns out it's an ad. Right, yeah, well it does, okay, so, do you think that the business model of only having subscriptions is sustainable long term? You're relying on just yep. one stream. 100%. Explain we please. We are a tech company. Okay. We know how to create technology that scales to a billion people. If there, there are some people in this world, you have your unique skill. My unique skill is running software that can service a lot of people. Yes. And even with a small subscription base, call it 10, 20 million subscribers, we are going to make a lot of money because it's a steady revenue stream. My estimate is that if we can make on the order of $500 million, we can run search for the whole planet yeah. with that kind of money. Okay. That's the power of scale. Are you planning to release your own version of YouTube with no ads? No. Why not? You have to solve search first. Plan, you know, step one, take on a trillion dollar problem and do really well. Step two, we'll figure out step two so after What's that. this trillion dollar problem? Search is a trillion and a half dollar industry. Yes. There is $150 billion of revenue every year being made on search. We are taking on one of the most well-established, entrenched businesses because we think we need to go back to basics. We need to go back to creating a product that works for you, that's not about exploiting you. Um, and once we solve that, I'm sure there'll be other problems we can take on. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about the crypto industry yeah. right now. We are at a tech conference. Blockchain yeah. is a big theme of this conference. It does seem to me that the industry is slowing down a little bit. Coinbase laying off 18% of, of its workers. Just one example, layoffs are happening all over the place. Do you think the crypto winter that we're experiencing right now, people have called it that, is going to put a damp or a slowdown in the terms of growth of the industry, growth of revenue, growth of innovation, and, uh, and when do you see this recover? Look, blockchain is foundational technology. Just like HTTP, which is the protocol that underlays the internet, it's a decentralized communication protocol, created the internet as we, do, as we know it today. I think decentralized storage is going to have a massive impact on everything. Things like DeFi and uh, NFTs are just the first step. As you digitize things like membership, put them on the blockchain so that this entrance, for example, to this conference could be an NFT, could be something that's recorded on the blockchain. There will be more and more use cases. But the problem is that early technologies get caught up in the hype and despair cycle. You're beginning to enter a despair cycle. So, but I think this is actually a great opportunity for companies to be building. We spun off an effort that started with NFT search called Neva.xyz, yeah. and we've actually spun it off into like a new entity that's focused on blockchain infrastructure. Right. We are actually very confident that there is value to be created here, but we have to be patient. And just so I'm clear, I don't recommend that people invest their life savings in crypto ever. It is a new asset class. Just like some people might decide they want to put two, three, maybe 5% of their assets in gold, 5% in emerging market stock or something like that. I think crypto should be seen as one of several components for people to have. Yeah. I put on the order of 1%, it's down somewhat. I'm just going to wait it out, it's okay. Investors concern, and I, and I agree with you, but investors concern here right now is that in a Dow market, a lot of really smart people, a lot of ex-Google engineers, you're not the only person from Google I've talked to, a lot of really smart engineers who have entered the digital currency space, a lot of ex-bankers who have entered De DeFi, they're gonna leave now because the money is drying up. Is that a concern for you? I think the, the people that have less conviction about the technology absolutely will leave. But I think there is a here here in terms of the value that it can create. I really feel like this is like 1997, 1998. What we are going through right now is the dot-com crash of 2000. It will work itself out. Um, and will some people leave because they're scared by what they see? Absolutely. But I think there's also a lot of building to be done. So your thesis is that like the dot-com bubble, the, uh, comp the tech companies with no value got wiped out. What you had left was the Amazon and the Googles and the Facebooks. So help us out here. If we're an investor picking a project, what are some of the projects we should look for? In other words, what's it, what are some of the utilities that have the most growth potential and will stay around? 
So clearly, like I should not be offering investment advice, but no. if you were to ask me personally what I do, I focus on the most important chains, which is Bitcoin, Ethereum. These are platforms that are going to stay. I make small bets on newcomers, whether it is Polygon in their Matic token or uh, Solana with their Sol token. Yeah. These are people with future potential. I invest occasionally in like the foundational applications of the blockchain space, which are things like uh, De the most important DeFi protocols, things like Uniswap, or maybe companies like Magic, you know, Magic Eden, which just announced their Series B, or OpenSea. So I, if I were to be a lay investor, I would stay very much in like the top echelon of these applications. There are experts that can invest in other areas, but it's a very volatile, very up and down kind of area. There's a, there's a belief that NFTs could be bigger than Bitcoin because there's more utility than just investments from, for, uh, for NFTs. It's early. I think we're going to see a lot of use cases. Everything from membership to games um, to fractional ownership. There's a lot of value to be created here. It's very early. Finally, I want to ask you about AI before you leave. You're yeah. very, uh, very knowledgeable about, about AI. There's a recent story, and I asked this to some people already, there's yeah. a recent story that a Google engineer was recently placed on leave because his superiors asked him to shut off a chatbot that he believes is already sentient. Uh, he said in his words to the Washington Post that, if I didn't know this was a computer program, I think it was a seven or eight year old child who knows physics. And he refused to shut it off because he believed it was sentient and he leaked this information, so he breached confidentiality rules by Google. So anyway, that's the story. Do you think AI is currently sentient, where we have the technology right now to produce sentient AI? I don't know if you have seen examples of what the large language models, which are the basis of things like this chatbot can do. Yeah. It is pretty magical. You can ask these models to write a summary for a second grader, and they will write a different summary than a summary for a sophisticated. You can take like a crypto article and say summarize this for a 10 year old and they will do a very different job from summarizing it for you. It's quite magical. But, um, and we use them a lot in Neva for search because we think they're going to be transformational in the search experience. So we're pretty excited by the field. On the other hand, things like sentience is yeah. not something one person can declare. Well, you I, need to publish a paper, yes. you need to have it peer reviewed, you need to have lots of people to look at it. You know, and I think this person was like jumped the gun in terms of making these declarations. Um, and that is likely the reason why Google reacted the way he did. I, I want to know from a software engineer's perspective, yeah. the technical definition of sentience, not a philosophical one, but when a machine becomes sentient, what does that mean? So this is a long and complicated topic. So one of the original tests in computer science is called a Turing test, which is if you are able to chat with this interface, and you cannot tell whether you're chatting with a real human being or you know, a computer program, that is when the program is set to pass. Sometimes I'm talking to real human beings and I don't know if I'm talking to a robot, but that's a but different conversation. Exactly. Yeah. But if a lot of people talk to this program and they all say, I can't tell whether this is a human or a bot, that is when something is said to have passed the Turing test. Um, and now you get into other complicated topics like is it self-aware? Can it like, it's one thing for it to feel what you're saying and understand it, but does it know itself? So you get into a lot of complicated topics, but the simplest test is the Turing test. Is it indistinguishable from talking to real people? I don't think we're anywhere close. Anywhere close. We, uh, there's a broader theme of singularity, AI singularity, when I think, I'll, I'll let you define it, but I believe it means that computers become self-learning and will start to basically start evolving on their own. Is that, is that something that you're looking out for? No. Um, I think these are written by people that want to like make a name for themselves and get it out there. <laughs> I'm in the nuts and bolts of how do I make a better search engine yeah. for David. So, you know, some of us have to work while others have to publish singularities. <laughs> Sridhar, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more.